Hello, good evening. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight for this evening's program, The Storytellers, Giving Agency to Your Ancestors. Uh, my name is Emma Ito, and I, she, her, and I'm in the Education and Program Specialist at the Library of Virginia. Um, and please feel th free throughout the program to type in any questions in the que questions box. Um, we are going to have some time at the end to answer audience questions. Uh, to see other upcoming Library of Virginia events, we're going to drop the link in the chat. Um, so go ahead and click our calendar. We do have an upcoming uh, Jewish genealogy program tomorrow, and we also have a book conversation with Josh Rothman uh, on his new book, The Ledger and the Chain, next week. Um, before we begin, I would like to honor and acknowledge that the Library of Virginia and where I'm speaking from right now rests on the ancestral lands of the indigenous people of the Powhatan Confederation, which is a paramount chieftain of about 30 Algonquian speaking groups. Um, I highly encourage you all to learn more and explore more and be aware of this, this honest history um, and to learn more about the Powhatan. So we're gonna drop some links in the chat um, from the National Park Service from the Virginia Indian Digital Archive and from Encyclopedia Virginia. Um, I also highly encourage you to be aware of what land you are living on and you can use Native Land Digital to, to learn that, which we'll also drop in the chat. Um, so I don't wanna spend too much time doing introductions because I, I think that a lot of your histories, Kim, Regina, and Alicia are gonna come out as we speak. Um, but I am very pleased and honored, humbled to be sharing this space with uh, Kim O'Connell, who's a, a writer and journalist, um, Alicia Arak, who's a, a media producer, director, and writer, and photojournalist Regina Boone. So we have three storytellers in three different mediums, which Alicia, a lot of, you're more than three. Um, you were more than one, one medium. Um, so I just wanna start off with you all talking a little bit about your family history and about your stories and what it was like to uncover that. Um, so if Alicia, you wanna start us off, we'll, we'll start with you and go to Kim and then go to Regina if that's all right with you. Yeah, that's fine, thank you. Thanks for having us here. So a lot of the history that I know is from my grandfather, my uh, maternal grandfather. I um, didn't know a lot about my grandmother's family and my, my dad's not from Virginia. Um, I just grew, I remember just hearing a lot about our uh, family through my grandfather in terms of um, our mixed ancestry. We, we you know, certainly have our African uh, American history. Um, we know of our indigenous history and we know of our you know, European history um, as well. Um, our family were really great documentarians. We have um, a photo album that has pictures from uh, the late 1900s. We have archival um, materials. So that, those kind of things already always fascinated me and much of our family. And then we, and we have a lot of really great documentarians around my whole family. So we kind of compare notes uh, wherever we are. Um, so, um, you know, that's a little bit to start off. Yeah, what about you, Kim? Well, thanks again for having all of us here. It's really great to be here. Um, so I write a lot about Vietnamese heritage and that is because I am the daughter of a Vietnamese immigrant who came to this country as a young bride to my white American father during the Vietnam War. And so um, for many different reasons that I've explored through my writing, you know, my parents split up in the 1970s and my father, the white man, was given custody. And mm -hmm. I think being raised by a white father in the 1970s with primary custody and me presenting as completely white, I have been cut off from my own Asian heritage in many ways. And so a big part of my professional work now has been to sort of do historic preservation, cultural preservation writing about Vietnamese communities in Virginia and namely in Arlington, which is where I'm from, because there was 
a very important uh, Vietnamese community that sprung up in Arlington after the fall of Saigon. And that was sort of my professional entrees, you know, quite some time ago to start thinking about Vietnamese heritage. And it didn't occur to me right away that that was my sort of doorway into a deeper investigation of my family and kind of the things that have torn my family apart in many ways, like the war that tore my mother from her homeland and that tore my parents apart. And in many ways, like my mother and I have had a difficult history where we've been torn apart from each other. And, and I've kind of felt this separation between who I am and my Asian heritage, you know? And, and so I'm sort of, I've been slowly embracing this idea that I am multiracial because for all these systemic and constructs that we probably will all talk about, it was easier for me to be a white person and to be raised as a white person. So, so it's kind of multi-layered as all these stories are, I'm sure that's kind of what I'm investigating in various ways through my writing. Thank you, Kim. Regina. Yes, hi. Thank you, Emma, for having us, um, as everyone else said. Um, so I guess in terms of my, uh, my story and where I am, I call this more of a journey. Um, you know, this is my Virginia side. My mother is not from Virginia. She's from Columbia, South Carolina. My father is the one who's from Virginia. And, and my history is that, um, that my father, Raymond Boone, he grew up identifying as a black man in Virginia who grew up in Suffolk, born in 1938, and who was a man that, you know, to me, he was just a black man. <laughs> and it wasn't until as I was growing up, children, other, my peers would often ask me, who is your dad? What is your dad? And to me, this question was just a kind of ludicrous question because I saw him as nothing else but black. And but then it would it it turned into eventually by the age of 13, I was told that his father was Japanese. And this was during a ride to pick up his college roommate who happened to be from Okinawa. And I guess my father thought it was like the right timing to let me know this clip of this little bit of information about my heritage and but it wasn't and that was when I was 13 so many years would go by where this was just sort of within me and I knew it but I didn't inquire I didn't ask many questions it would it would go maybe like a decade and then another decade and then it wasn't until um, I was in college that I decided after graduating, when I was thinking about what I was doing after finishing Spelman, I had this desire to go to Japan. And this is where I went on the JET program to teach English as a second language. And as a part of my application, I said I wanted to go to Japan to learn more about a part of me, a part of me that my family did not know. And so it, that's kind of, so this has sort of been, you know, I've been uh, sort of, how do I say it? Um, it's been a lifelong, I mean, it's been a lifelong unraveling. It's been a lifelong uh, piecing together. And it's been recent in the past uh, three years that sort of this full, not full story, but a more complete story of my grandfather, my Japanese grandfather and who he was and what was his story has really come together because uh, seven years ago, my dad was dying of pancreatic cancer and on his deathbed, he basically gave me his last uh, assignment to find out what happened to my grandfather in Suffolk, Virginia and to begin to, and for me to tell his story and for it not to be left untold. So I'll leave it at that in terms of sort of, you know, just the background of who I am right now, of my Virginia side being black and Japanese. Thank you all so much for, for just a glimpse into that. Um, and I feel like when, when all three of you talk, it just shows these are all such multi-layered layered histories. And, and Regina, I love what you said about journeys because that's really, I'm sure, what it, what it kind of feels like. So I'm, I'm interested a little bit more on you guys expanding. How has that journey been for, for you and your families? Um, and like, 
kind of what is what has it been like uncovering things that you may not have known before um and again like feel free to alicia if you want to start us off but you feel free to jump jump off one another so in terms of discovering um it's it's been a mixture it's been um you know it's been exciting to confirm things that we've always heard from our grandfather um uh, particularly on you know a lot of it has been around our um, indigenous ancestry and um you know I, I remember my grandfather saying really I, I remember maybe being about seven or eight him just saying to me you know it was it was safer to identify as black um, and not indigenous um my grandfather you know had a very you know different appearance my whole family that side of the family we were always considered uh my mother and you know aunts and everyone would talk about how they felt different they stood out they didn't they didn't look like everyone else so uh and then looking in these books you could see that in the pictures so through our, our um you know history we we learned and confirmed a lot of what he talked about in terms of our indigenous um ancestry um, and then certainly on our African American ancestry, you know, the thing that was, you know, a, a, I think most upsetting is, you know, being able to look at, you know, I think my third great grandmother who was enslaved, and and know the name of the person, her enslaver, and know that that person was actually her father. I think that was the most um, disturbing thing to hear, um, but also. Uh, recently when the Lee Memorial, the Lee uh, Monument was announced coming down and still up, um, knowing about my third great grandfather, the person she was married to, um, knowing that he worked for Lee and, and, and as a, a porter. And I, I wondered what his life was like um, <clears throat> the Civil War as a porter for Robert E. Lee. So when that um, monument was announced that it was coming down, you know, I, I had I had a reaction that I didn't really expect. It was just, um, I, I can't explain it. I, it just made me wonder um, about, again, what his life was like and what, you know, what that meant for me to, you know, think about um, in terms of, you know, learning more about what his experience was like in the, the Civil War uh, as a free person of color. Um, so those are just some some of the things that, I learned and, and many of my family members are still learning uh, in their research. I'm not the only one doing this, this work. You know, my sister, my mother, I have a cousin who actually wrote her dissertation on some of this. Uh, so all of us are putting these pieces together and confirming, basically confirming a lot of the oral history that we've been hearing for, for years. Thank you, Alicia. Regina, what do, what do you what do you think? What are your thoughts? Um, remind me exactly of the question yeah, again. So um, I, I was thinking a lot too, Alicia, while you're talking. So I asked, what was it like kind of, what has this journey been and what is it like to uncover that? And I think I want to add, Alicia, after you said, said that is kind of thinking on like, yeah, what, what is that experience like trying to feel how your ancestors may have felt? Because it's very emotional. Um, and how do you balance those feelings as you do your research? Um, oh, do you want, you want me to finish yeah, up on that? Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty powerful. And we, before, offline, we were talking about the book, um, by grandmother's hands. And, um, I, I spent quite a bit of time talking to my ancestors and trying to, you know, close my eyes and imagine their faces and imagine, imagine them talking to me. Um, it's a little scary at times because I want to invite, uh, the people that I know loved and cared for us, like you know my black and indigenous ancestors. I don't really want to invite the um, the white the enslavers uh, from my ancestry, and that part is a little not a little. It's 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 really scary. Um, so fortunately, I haven't felt that presence. I, I usually feel a, a, a powerful, warm, loving presence. Um, so I do I do take intentional time to invite my ancestors in 
um, to, to speak to me and, you know, guide me <laughs> uh, many times when, when there's something really tough going on. Um, so that's, that's how I approach it. Thank you. Regina, I, uh, I'm going to hop to you because I would say your ancestor has guided me as well. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I was going to say, so this journey for me has definitely been led by my ancestors for, for sure. I mean, from the beginning, my father um, just basically days before dying and then passing. And so passing this baton to me to find out more about the Japanese side of, of our family. And I believe my father has been guiding me this entire journey and he's been nudging me and he's been sending me signs. And I believe my grandfather, for, so the number one sign, he he allowed Emma and I to meet at the Library of Virginia when I was in the midst of just sort of digging into this research. Um, I, I had the opportunity of having a Knight Wallace journalism uh, fellowship at the University of Michigan where I was given eight months basically outside of the newsroom to really delve into this research. And so during a Christmas break, uh, uh, winter break, I came back to Virginia and I was led to the library because I thought, well, why not start at the library, the Library of Virginia, to look for any information on Japanese, Japanese American people of Japanese descent in Virginia. And so I asked the librarian and unfortunately there was no information, but luckily for me, and I think this is where ancestors came in and some nudging, some energy work. Um, another library, another person at the library was listening and luckily said, wait a minute, there's someone here that uh, her name is Emma Ito and she just recently started working here and her master's project was on Japanese Americans in Virginia during the Jim Crow. And, and I said, what? And, I, and then it was just from that minute that Emma and I met that we knew, I'm, I'm basically like a pullout, I always say to Emma, of her dissertation, of her master's project. Her, my grandfather's name was is within her, her research, in your, within your research, Emma. Um, and so, yeah, I think you were brought to me to kind of guide me and get a framework of the historical, uh, what foundation of where my grandfather was in this Virginia landscape. And then I think uh, along the way, this journey has been like fulfilling. It's been heartbreaking. It's been, I mean, it's just, it's been about, a, it's been so emotional and just always like Alicia said, just sort of wanting to feel what my grandfather felt, feel what my grandmother, my black grandmother, how she felt on December 7th, 1941 in Suffolk, Virginia, when American, um, uh, when police officers came and basically hours after the bomb dropped in Japan, I mean, in Pearl Harbor by Japanese, that my grandfather was arrested at about 2 p.m. Eastern time and how their life completely shifted. So, yeah, it's, I mean, now I completely understand this history, this period in such a different way, but not just with a black lens, not just with a black multiracial, you know, but with this added lens of a, of, of a man, my grandfather, who was of Japanese descent in the, in the South, because if you do learn this history, typically we only learn it, but we only learn about what happened on the West Coast. Um, and then also there's never this intersection typically of talking about the black community and the Japanese community intersecting in a positive way. I could go on and on, but I want to pass it to Kim. And so I feel like I'm talking too much. Okay. This is difficult. Oh no. <laughs> well, it, it, yeah, it's interesting to listen both of you because I think the journey is just, it's like episodic, you know, it kind of goes back and forward in time. It's not like you're on a little train car going in forward direction all the time. Like you're kind of in jumbles. Like my my journey to writing about my family history and my ancestors kind of starts with me and my mother and it kind of goes backward from there, but in a way like swoops always back around to me and my mother. Like my relationship with my mother is like, probably I can say the most important relationship of my life, probably because it's the most difficult relationship of my life. And so when I, so to get personal a little bit, um, 
No, my mother, my parents divorced when I was young and my dad got custody, like I said, and then my mother and I were estranged from each other for many, many years, like over 10 years. Like I got married, I had a child before she and I reconciled. And so, and, and here I am like, you know, white girl in, in Maryland where I grew up before I moved to Virginia, not really thinking twice about it, but feeling that emptiness a little bit and mostly feeling all this resentment towards my mother thinking like, you know, why is she not a bigger part of my life? And, you know, what, you know, why, why has she sort of abandoned us? And so it, it's a difficult thing, but I realized that growing up, my feelings toward her were very negative and had no compassion for her experience and no real deep understanding of what she had gone through. And, you know, thank God we all grow up because eventually as an adult, I matured and started to realize, A, that something's missing in my own life and that the way, if I'm ever going to fill this hole that I feel, I need to reach out to my mother, you know, and try to understand what happened, like why there was this root of this disagreement with us and not to get too far in the weeds, but just as an example, and I was king of what you said, Alicia, about, you know, presenting as indigenous or black or whatever, um, you were saying about that because my mother, you know, it's kind of similarly when she was in, you know, came to the United States, married a white American, had two children. And she said, we are going to be completely at a completely American family, completely Americanized family. You're white kids. I'm not going to teach you Vietnamese. We're not going to cook Viet Vietnamese food. Just really like she pushed her heritage away and she pushed her country away. She never went back to Vietnam I and mean, she's still alive, but she, will never go back now like she's never gone back and um and I thought like what are the forces that have led my mother to feel that she has to turn her back on her whole history and her everything that makes her who she is to turn her back completely and like when I started to understand some of those things and understand like the trauma of leaving her country during a war you know, the trauma of coming to the United States and having to completely like kind of subjugate your Asian-ness to survive, to tell your own children, don't be like me, don't identify as Asian, don't speak Asian. Like it like not only opened up tons of avenues of research you know, to get to the research journey in terms of how all this happens and, you know, the way refugees and immigrants feel and some of the traumas that they endure, but it also really helped me to understand my mother. And our relationship is not perfect by a long shot. And there are many other things I could talk about, but it comes from much greater understanding. It's been like by far the best work of my life to understand what she's gone through more and not take her estrangements when I was younger so personally and to understand the root of it. Like, and I was thinking about something the other day that my mother, like, I wrote an essay recently about body image and because body image between my, my, my mother was a point of contention between us in part because I'm a big white, white presenting big girl and she's a tiny Asian woman. And we had lots of conflicts about body image and she had had to deal with the fact that there is um, there was a long history of French colonialization in Vietnam. And so she has French blood in her probably the result of rape, I don't know for sure, but she has what I consider French colonial blood in her. So part of that makes my mother present as more white skinned and more Western featured than a lot of Vietnamese women. And so that has caused a lot of, I think, angst for her among her peers in her society. And it also made her very focused when she was younger on how she looks like you know, who does she look like? Am I Asian enough? And do I look Asian enough? Or is it a benefit that I don't look Asian? And some of that definitely passed on to me too, as I struggle with my Asian-ness as a clearly white looking multiracial person. So I feel like that was very rambly, but, but that's the nature of these journeys. Like I feel like, so I've done a lot of research into like the French colonial period of Vietnam and how the women were treated and you know, I'm not really always researching my own family history, but I feel like all of that informs what happened in my own family. And I think it's worth writing about because I, I think probably lots of other families have gone through similar things. 
Uh, when you say though that um, when you say all of that, like the theme, when you peel it all back is white supremacy and that yeah. washing, I mean, I think we need to really state it and why we even are having these layered convoluted um, painful traumatic conversations because white supremacy is the disease that is amongst all of us. And I think we can't have a conversation without saying that and what has caused the pain in your family. I mean, because you complete, you keep saying about being white presenting. It's like this white conversation has really taken over the narrative for you. I mean, it's a part of you. It's a part of me. It's a part of Alicia. It's a part of Emma, but it's really, it's done a number on this whole country. And mm -hmm. that's why these conversations are important, but I think it's important to really call it what it is and not talk yeah. around it. And why do it's this, why is white so, I mean, this is a, this is, this is evil. <laughs> this yeah. is, um, I mean, this is, this is a psychological problem. This is a disease. This is pain and trauma. I mean, we all wouldn't be sitting here if we were all, you know, if this history was all happy-go-lucky. Let's just face it. This wouldn't even be a this. We wouldn't we wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation. Yeah, yeah. I, I I think a lot about how in the 1970s, you know, before really a lot of women's equality had taken hold. If there was a divorce and children's in, were involved, like the mother almost always got custody if she wanted it. But my Asian mother did not get custody because a white judge in Maryland decided, a white male judge in Maryland decided that my mother wasn't fit and said things. Mm -hmm. I have those divorce papers because my father no, is no longer alive. And so I have all the divorce documents and I have all the writing about how they were dancing around the fact that like these these American born kids can't possibly be raised by a single Asian mother, basically. And so that is another thing that I, I reckon with, and I think, you know, falls under the white supremacy label for sure, that had deep consequences for my family, for sure. That's for all of our family. Right, exactly. for all of our family. Thank you, Regina, for bringing that up, because I, Alicia, when we were having an email conversation before we started, I think a lot about the quote that you said that we used for the description, actually, when you said that storytelling is a way to resist and disrupt current structural inequities and racism, as well as the ongoing threat of erasure of our ancestors' legacies. I, I think about that quote a lot because I feel like it makes me think a lot about how racism and white supremacy, as you said, Regina, has touched all of these stories. So. Um, I'm just curious kind of to bounce off of that for you all, like how has that process been as you do this labor and, and how do you balance the trauma and the healing to go back to, to my, my grandmother's hands, like thinking about the ancestors and healing too. Um, Alicia, do you want, Alicia, since that was your yeah. quote, do you want to start us off? Yeah, um, you know, I, I first think about, you know, what Gina said and you know, thinking about just how insidious white supremacy is and how it has, you know, separated us from, you know, as some of my um, indigenous friends who are supporting me in this lifelong journey say my, my kin, my, my kin, how they've separated us, my, my family from our kin, you know, how races were changed from location to location uh, now, for the indigenous community, that was uh, paper gen genocide. You know, if you if you looked like you had any brown in you, you were not white, and and that way they could <clears throat> take away your land or whatever that is. You know, um, you know, having you know, having to um, also the psychology with the, even in their own community having to you know, explained who you are, you know, people looking at you and saying, are you, or what, you know, what are you, you know, um, that has, that is internalized um, racism and oppression that we didn't do that to ourselves. Someone else did that to us. It's just, <laughs> I won't use bad language, but it's, it's a mind, you know what. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's a safe yeah. space. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about the hundred or so people. Oh, that's listen. true. I, I'm forgetting that there's other people out there, not just the four of us. <laughs> so, you know, um, Emma, you and I have talked about, brought up Walter Plecker. You know, I, I worked for a university a while. I worked with a group of family medicine um, physicians. And I asked them, had they ever heard of Walter Plecker? None of them had ever heard of him, which I found really fascinating because he was a family physician. Uh, he decided what race you were. He instructed nurses and uh, people to, to, to decide who was white, who was black. He he created the bi racial binary, which wiped out um, people who may not have been black or white, uh, indigenous in this case. Um, so, I mean, I could go on, but this is all by design and we, we are still dismantling it. Um, it's, it's exhausting. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll just stop there and let my... Um, my co-panelists add to that. I just want to quickly add, jump in with some historical context. Um, Alicia, I'm so glad you brought up Walter Plecker because we talk about him a lot. And I think you said in a past conversation something about um, erasure by pen. And that is really what he did. So hopefully um, my colleague Ashley can maybe drop a Encyclopedia Virginia link on Plecker and the 1924 Racial Integrity Act, which really shaped race in a binary way. And still that continues. Um, and Kim and Regina and Alicia, I think we all, we all see that in our work and we feel it. Um, so I don't know if you guys, uh, Kim and Regina want to talk a little bit more about that. I was just going to pick up on like the, you know, the erasure uh, theme, because when I really think about it, um, I think that had been weighing heavy on my father's um, heart his entire life. And, you know, he was fighting for, for justice for all people, but specifically for the black community. But I think within his heart, of course, he knew that he was Japanese and he knew the wrongs that were, um, you know, thrusted upon his family, the, you know, the family was split apart. Um, he, his, his father was never, never returned to him. So my dad carried so much pain and trauma, but I didn't understand that pain and trauma that he, he carried because I didn't know the story. So I think when it came to the point where he was dying and, and, and slipping away, he knew the importance that if he slipped away and he did not give me these instructions and sort of the blessing to delve into this research, this, I would not be sitting here. It would be erased. I would, I would, I would probably have respected my father and not, maybe I wouldn't have, um, you know, gone on this complete journey. And so I think that's what history, you know, that's what have been, that's what was intended, I think, or that's would have been what would have been preferred for my story, our stories not to come out. And so, but my dad being a journalist knew, no, this story has to come out. He said, Regina, you must tell your grandfather's story. You must tell about Virginia. You must tell about the racist ways. So it's like he knew, okay, no, we cannot have this erased. So then it's like the ancestors then though helped me align to find the paperwork, to get the archives, to have these serendipitous meetings with people that make the history all come together. And so that's why it's so important to like listen to the clues, listen to the hints, listen to the whispers from our ancestors um, because they are nudging us and they, but it's a matter of listening and really being intentional and really also understanding the power of the personal narrative, no matter how layered and convoluted it is and how painful it is. Because yes, it is quite painful. It is very tiring. As Alicia said, it's, it is, it's, I mean, even I have to be honest, having this conversation now, it's draining. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying, but that's just the fact, you know, and, and like, it's, but it's important because to know our history is to know our future, is to, what's it, like, to know our future, right, and know the path that we need to go on. So I can 
better uh, navigate because I know the past and I know who I am more and I know I can feel the pain from my dad and now I feel like he knew that I could handle the pain and also he knew that maybe I'm a part of the healing process. And I think that's what all of us collectively are doing. We are a part of healing, not only for ourselves individually, for our families, for our, each of our worlds, and then all the people we are touching right now who are listening to us, by us telling our individual stories, this is helping our community and beyond. So it's a ripple. And that's why it's so important for us each to keep speaking loudly proudly and keep digging and feeling that pain because we know where there's pain eventually you can exhale and eventually like you know the lotus flower a lotus will burst out of mud it's that's what i feel like we each are versions of a lotus um we are pushing through the mud to tell our stories that's beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> That's so beautiful. <laughs> I don't know where it came from. I think my ancestors, my people are speaking through me. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Kim, did Sorry. you have any other thoughts on, on this kind of topic and thinking of healing? Um, well, but I had so many thoughts while my yeah. panelists were talking with such amazing things, but um, my work starting on this journey to write about sort of Vietnamese heritage more generally in different communities and in my own, started in Arlington, like I mentioned, which where there was this significant, you know, community that developed of refugees after the fall of Saigon. And I started that work in graduate school, it was like mm, 2002, 2003, and the community didn't last very long because as you can imagine, like they, a bunch of refugees landed in 75 after the fall of Saigon, and this is Arlington, it's kind of a high rent district right outside Washington, DC. By the early 80s, the county landlords and county officials were kind of like, we're ready to upscale this place. And in fact, there was an article in the Washington Post just this week talking about how high rent upscale this neighborhood is now. Um, and they referenced the fact that it began as Little Saigon is what it used to be called. And so when I started researching in around 2002, like nobody had documented this history. I mean, it felt like it had just completely poof, like erased, you know, um, because the community sort of was there for a while. They they saved this old part of Arlington that had kind of fallen apart because of metro construction and just wasn't in doing that great. These immigrants, these refugees saved it. But then they were, because rent started rising because the metro was getting done and the county kind of said, I mean, kind of the county overlord said, you know, we don't want you here anymore. We're gonna keep raising the rents until you all move. And then the community moved west to another commercial center uh, called the Eden Center in Falls Church. So they, there's, they still had a place, but it was not Arlington. So when I started writing about it, like, like the, no one had really documented this history at all. No one had reached out to find anyone who had worked there, shopped there, lived there. And I I mean, I didn't realize I'd ha have to be like a, like a, what do you call it? a trailblazer to do this work, but I was like finding people and interviewing them. And I remember what was so heartbreaking for me back in 2002, 2003, like when I was first reaching someone saying, I'm doing some research about Little Saigon. I'm trying to write, write the history of Little Saigon. And they'd be like, well, why do you want to talk to me? Like, mm. I just you know, ran, I just sold tea. I just sold tea in this, or in this little shop, or I, you know, had a fabric store on the corner, like, you know, what do you want to write? Talk, ask, ask me questions for and there's like all this feeling like like my story wasn't worth it you know so that was really eye-opening to me that you know these people changed this county for the better and um Arlington as you may know you know like, like a, a lot of northern Virginia really prides itself on being a diverse and progressive and forward-thinking county you know a close and suburb of the nation's capital but you know in many ways it it had a responsibility in kicking out these people and this whole community that that left Arlington basically. So, so I really felt like kind of a duty then, and maybe that's where you know these people aren't my ancestors. I'm not related to them, but 
they feel like my people and I felt a responsibility to them to lift up these stories and make them know that selling tea in a shop that you're renting in a new land, you know, six months after you were forced out of a war-torn country is like pretty damn amazing. Like it was, you know, so anyway, like it was really an interesting research journey for me to to realize that. And I feel like, you know, I, I don't want to come in like, oh, I like told you like, that your story is important and they embraced me and all it wasn't always like that you know some people eventually wanted to talk to me and some people never talked to me but um it was an interesting process but now i feel like that project and the sub subsequent writing efforts i've done in the community have helped to grow a sense of the importance of this community in this in this state basically that continued you know up, little ups and downs but mostly continued over the years since but kind of came from nothing. I like that word that you use, uh, duty. I think I, I, I agree. I feel like I have a duty to speak um, or to like keep telling my grandfather's story on the other 20, what was it, how many men? 20, 22 other men or 23 other men that were in the Tidewater, Japanese men in the Tidewater area. And I think that's where like my relationship with Emma comes in and her work and um, but also it's so relevant today to show the the two I feel this duty to show the the relationships between the Japanese community Japanese and Japanese American community in Tidewater with a black community because I mean everything that's happening today and to show the history that this is not that two groups were together and it's because once again it's not that the two groups are against each other are we are being pitted against each other and that's what's happening everywhere it's and that's where white supremacy i hate to sound like a broken record but that's it again so anyway the duty i have that i feel that too yeah Alicia, what about you do you feel like you get that sense sometimes I, I'm not sure what question. <laughs> I'm sorry. So I'm just thinking about like, yeah, like the. I, I think I, 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 I know you're fine. I'm like, I'm thinking a little bit about like Kim and Regina, what you're talking about, a sense of duty. Like, I, I know when I do this work, sometimes I feel like I owe it to my ancestors. And it's why I push myself so hard sometimes to, because I, I have, I feel like I have to. And so like, how do you, this is like kind of a new question too, is like, how do you balance that? Like, how do you take care of yourself while also trying to balance that that feeling? Hmm. And Alicia, I'll, I'll start off. Well, if it's okay, I'll start off with with you. I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. Um, it's it's hard. Um, so I, I definitely feel that duty as well. That's why I'm I'm here in, in this space and have take has have taken an opportunity to be in other spaces like this, it, it's definitely a, a duty because, um, you know, our ancestors suffered and and thrived, but suffered so much for us, for us to be here. And now, you know, I, I have kids um, as well. And now there's another generation. It's it's our duty. And, and they were silenced. They were silenced. They had no power to push back on anything that was happening to, I, I won't say they didn't have any power. They had collective and community power, which allowed them to move forward. But in the system and as in, and within structures, they, they didn't have the power. Um, so I, I definitely feel that duty. Um, but as far as balancing that, uh, again, I, I choose what I, I want to share and you know with the world and and then the things that i feel like are, that i need to spend time with that i encounter I, I do that or i do that in a safe space with family or you know people that i feel like can really help with you know with with the journey because it is a, a lifelong journey you know I, I started out talking about my you know this what i discovered in terms of indigenous ancestry and I, i'm leading with that because 
I, I know I have African ancestry. It's, it's, you know, there's, there's no doubt about that. I know who those people are. I know, you know, those family members, I know who they are. I know, you know, I know that, but the part that I always heard in whispers, you know, that we only, we talked about in their family, or, you know, we find out years later from another cousin that we didn't grow up with. You heard that story too? Yeah, I heard that story. What did you know? Um, that That's why I led with that. Um, and that's been a difficult journey um, because it's it's not so, you know, as Regina said, you know, we have been all pitted against one another. And so it's not so easy to come up. I'm not claiming, um, I didn't grow up in the indigenous culture, so I cannot claim that I will spend the rest of my life remembering what was lost and taken away. I do know of family members that did participate in the culture. Um, and this is around the 1950s or 60s. Um, there were family members that were, but once they died off, they, they didn't share a lot of that, that with their children. So once they left, you know, we didn't know. So I don't know if I have a good answer about how to balance it. It's just, um, it's an ongoing process and, and finding those ways, again, tell, telling the story, talking to other people, you know, finding people who are willing to, um, you know, share their journey with, you know, share journeys together. Um, that That's how I've balanced it a little bit. Regina or Kim, any thoughts about balancing? Yeah, I think um, for me, the balance, um, you know, this is kind of all really new within the past, uh, since 2017, that it's kind of been this intense part of the journey where I've really um, been immersed in the archives and the conversations in these sort of in this kind of conversation um, that it's been like exciting and exhilarating and uh, but at the same time like I said before it, it brings up a lot of emotion and so I think I have learned um, what triggers me and so I have to dial back and I'm very um as all of you know here <laughs> and some people might know who are listening I I wear my emotions and I I can't hide things I speak my truth and when I feel something I feel it so I have had to learn how to really balance this 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 journey so that I don't become sick <laughs> in in many ways and become overwhelmed. Um, but I'll say those eight months that I was intensely on the journey of like every day I was finding out something new about my grandfather, and every day I was like it was like going on a treasure hunt, and it was like a new part of me was just like pinging all over my body and it was really wow right but then there were some days where I came to I would I would find out like my grandfather I thought I had found his grave in Cook County in Chicago and then I I found out that he was um cremated and he wasn't buried and then I found out from a funeral home oh that funeral home that took his ashes they are no longer around so like that was an emotional roller coaster where I had to really um, like I thought I was going to go and sit by his grave in Chicago right at that point. And so that I remember sort of like I felt nauseous learning that I thought I was going to sort of meet him um, and then I couldn't. But then later down the road, I did find him. So I've been on all these twists. But again, my my theme in terms of. Um, the balance and is to really be self-aware and to be really in tune to um, self-care. And this kind of work is deep, it's heavy, and it's not for everyone. And I think we are part of a chosen group. I mean, I don't want to sound like everybody can't do this, but I really do think it is it's special work. This is special. 
And, you know, and there's no coincidence that we have all met up like this to have this conversation. So, um, but self care is the theme and being self aware of the triggers and also being able the power of saying no to certain conversations and not entering every room that you're invited into. Thank you, Regina. I love that. I love how you you're someone in particular who always reminds me to be really intentional. And I think that all three of you have been very intentional in the work that you do. Um, and I, I love that you brought up the self care piece because it is it's mental health awareness month, actually. And I, I think that's a big piece for everyone to, to keep in mind. So I'm, I'm glad you guys both Alicia and Regina brought that up. Um, Kim, I didn't mean to cut you off. What were your thoughts about kind of balancing that? Well, I, it's great that you brought up the mental health quotient or part of it because, you know, my, my mother does suffer from pretty serious mental illness. And that's another big factor in kind of the difficulty of our relationships. And the last year has been really hard for her. And it's been really hard for me too because she's had all these very real problems that have come up and I won't get into all of them, but they're all kind of pandemic related. And I'm kind of, you know, I'm the only child she has that she that that she relies on. And what I have found is it's taken a lot of energy to help her. And when I'm really deep in helping her with various things, it kind of just sucks out any creative energy I have to kind of think about the stories that I want to tell and write about the stories. So, you know, so I guess a challenge for me has been just to sit with this difficult time that we've all been in and you know just know that i'll be able to get back to the storytelling which you know is i find very healing and i guess i should have led with that like the storytelling it's not always easy but it to me has overall felt like very healing work and i like to do it i really i've published quite a few personal es essays at this point about my relationship with my mother i you know it's like a like a an itch i just can't scratch enough you know um but I find it overall to be extremely healing for me. And, and hopefully maybe, I don't know if it's healing for my relationship. I mean, my mother doesn't always know about what I write, which is maybe an ethical thing we could talk about. I don't show her everything. I write about her, but she doesn't always know it because I try to think like, well, I'm writing my story, but, um, but I hope by healing me more, it, it heals our relationship. So I think that's valuable. But right now, honestly, I've been, struggling like struggling to kind of get to that creative space because things are just hard right now and that's i guess true for so many of us in so many different ways so my challenge right now is just to be um gentle and kind and it's hard when you're a creative person like we all are um i mean i mean sometimes the creativity just comes out of you, you just gotta get down to your desk and you just want to write and when you feel like like i kind of get stumbling blocks with that when i'm feeling emotionally really drained and that's kind of where I've been lately but you know I hopefully things are getting better and I'll be able to get back to a space where I can kind of go back to that more of a healing sense of writing so we'll see <laughs> it makes but. me think of how Regina you said earlier how like we and it's uh my grandmother's hand too is like we heal ourselves first and then we do the collective healing by healing ourselves um so I really appreciate you sharing that Kim and Regina you saying those words earlier um, I want to keep an eye on time. It's already seven, uh, which is wow. wild. We, we just don't have to know. Um, and, you know, to share with the audience, you know, we had a couple of conversations before this and we wanted to make it really clear that like these stories, this is scratching the surface. I mean, like Kim and Alicia and Regina and I have had like hour long, two hour long conversations already. And like, I know there's so many other topics we can dive into. So, you know, it is, it's, complex and these stories are, are important and more than just one talk, I think. Um, but I do want to really focus too on, you know, what would you guys like to see in the future? Like what is your dreams with your your history and your stories that are shared? And how does that, what does it mean for us as a society today, um, all the work that you all do? Alicia, do you wanna start us off? Yeah, I'll start us off. Yeah, that that's a really, really important question. Um, 
I wrote some things down for that one because I didn't want to forget since this is being recorded. And um, um, here, I, I think nationally, not just here in Richmond or in Virginia, you know, the stories of, you know, black, indigenous, non-white people are for sale. They are a commodity. There are cultural institutions that benefit from that. Um, many of them hold our ancestors' bones and bodies. And um, I, I would like to see institutions give up that power they hold over curating those stories and curating them um, you know, in silos or without inviting us into the conversation. You know, those narratives are often incomplete or skewed or wrong. So I would like to see these conversations to move beyond, you know, transactional. You know, I, I never know if, if what I'm saying or any of us are saying is landing. Um, if, if people are saying it's landing, is it really landing? Do you see any change? Is it performative? I, I would like to see us move past that and, and, and see actual change in how our stories are, um, you know, the, the stewardship behind that. It's, um, you know, we, we should be leading that, not white-led organizations. Um, and and not certainly not without us not being present and a part of curating that. Uh, so that's that's what I would like to see. Thank you. Powerful and important. Regina, what about you? Um, so I've been lucky in terms of this. I think in terms of uh, I really don't have any white folks trying to tell this story because i'm pretty much like a bulldog about it like stay away from me don't don't come near me and don't try to steal my story or try to tell it i do say no often to people um and this is my story and the people i want to work with i'm very um intentional about emma and i emma we work together and about amplifying the story of uh people of japanese descent in virginia and so i'm so lucky that i found emma i'm so lucky that nhk uh which is the public tv in japan they found an interest in my story so that really and i trusted them um to tell my story because actually there was a um a public radio podcast that found out about my story early on when i was at the university of michigan who like really wanted me, wanted to follow me and wanted to, before NHK got involved. And luckily I said, no. And mm -hmm. I said, no, thank you. I will, I will do this myself. I'm a journalist and I will find, I mean, if anywhere, I will tell it through the Richmond Free Press, my, my family's newspaper here in Richmond. Oh, sorry, that's my dog, Jake. Um, I guess he concurs. Um, but I, but in terms of what I want to do, um, besides saying no to people that shouldn't tell my story, I want to say yes to a. Can you hold on? Um, I do have dreams that that like I would love to have a marker. We've talked about this, a marker that uh, has all of the men, their names, all the Jap Japanese men who were Virginians, and that their stories are each told, not just my grandfather, but but also using the history that Emma has researched and us coming together and creating a huge project and showing that Japanese Americans were not just on the West Coast, that we have a rich history in here in Virginia. So like I have that dream to have a marker, I have a dream to one day have maybe a tour like of like historical landmarks of within Virginia where Japanese Americans and people of Japanese descent were here and where the intersections happened. Like for instance, in Norfolk, there's a street that there were so many Japanese restaurants on this street, but this was a black community. My grandfather, he owned a restaurant in the segregated part of town in the black community of Suffolk called the Fairgrounds. Um, so I have these dreams of like, 
it being lot I mean we are talking about it now this is being recorded so obviously our conversation is going into an archive hopefully all the people out there the 54 people out there listening hopefully this is rippling to them and they are taking all of our stories in but not only this is the other thing from my research that I've learned when this documentary that NHK did on my journey um, when it shows I can always tell when it airs because I get so much um, private messages on social media. And people tell me how I, my story has helped them to heal and is helping them um, to find the truth of, of who they are or who their family is. And so to me, it's like, um, I just wanna keep talking because as I speak, and tell this story, I know even if I impact one person tonight, that's more than no one, right? Whether it helps them personally or it helps them to understand history, I think it's all important. So it's a, a ramp. I mean, this is like the night of rambling. So <laughs> for it's, me, perfect. it's not rambling, it's perfect. So anyway, I mean, there's just so many layers and there are so many dreams I've had. I mean, I would love to hit the lotto so I could just do this full time and tell the story <laughs> of, you know, my Japanese ancestry as well as my black ancestry here in Virginia and my mother's family in, in South Carolina and just put it all on the map. I mean, that's how we can just become better people, right? To know each other's stories. Stories are powerful. So cool. Yeah, so Kim, tell us, take it in. <laughs> Stories really are powerful and I want more of them also. Um, so five years ago, um, one major significant milestone in Arlington with the work that I do is that with the with some help from the Virginia Humanities Organization and Arlington, we, I, we published a booklet that I wrote that was called Echoes of Little Saigon that documented little saigon in booklet form and it was widely spread out like around the county like like people still talk about it and i'm really happy that that happened because i've been able to give a lot of talks about that and then i kind of spun it into a walking tour that i've given to like i don't know a dozen groups over over the years and it's funny because if you go to arlington or that part of arlington now there's like one restaurant left nam Viet, from the little saigon era so i had to stand in front of some glass high rides and hold up like a historic picture, but I don't want it to be forgotten. I want people to say like, this is what was here. And I use each stop to talk about the importance of each of those things. There were a lot of jewelry stores because jewelry was currency, you know, for refugees. And there were fabric stores because those stores were needed to clothe these people in, in with fabric and clothes that they recognized. And of course there was food and groceries. And so I, that's one way that I want to keep telling the story, but I, I would like to see more support, <laughs> which is the hard part. Um, the, the creation of that booklet was based on the collection of about a dozen oral histories of Vietnamese community members. I did a couple of them. Most of them were done by Virginia Tech students. And then I did other interviews too that weren't sort of formal oral histories. And that was a project that Arlington County was funding. It was in a line in their budget. They were funding oral history collection for Vietnamese, uh, for Vietnamese immigrants. And then a couple of years ago, that, that line item in the budget just went away and there's no more budget. And, you know, of course I will and do go out and collect stories myself on my own recorder that I upload and transcribe on my own computer. But when backed by the county, it becomes a searchable document that lives on in the library system that future people can read and look at you know it has that kind of institutional backing and the library of virginia i don't think has any oral history transcripts or recordings of vietnamese americans for sure maybe not any other asian americans or you know others so i would like to see more institutional support and funding for the collection of oral history oral histories because like you said stories are powerful and the people being interviewed don't may not think that they their stories are important so we will be here to say no your story is important and other people need to realize your story is important so that's one dream of mine is to really gather more stories from people who are really scattering and, and harder to find now too before they all disappear into the wind um 
And then I too would really, really, really like to see some sort of historical marker in Arlington where the first little Saigon in Washington, the Washington DC area, era, area was created because it was so fleeting. Like it's, it lasted lo less than 10 years. And to me, it was incredibly significant. And I feel like if, if Arlington hadn't allowed those Vietnamese immigrants to establish that community, I don't know if Arlington would become the kind of progressive, diverse county that it really wants to be, that it sometimes is and really wants to be. And so I sort of feel like if you want to benefit from this history in the way this county is marketed to people, then show me that you mean it by at least let's acknowledge this place with a historical marker. You know, which I feel like it's just even just like a sign on the sidewalk. It's not even that big a thing. But like Regina, like what you're saying, I just feel like it's an important permanent thing for everybody to walk by and just remember these people. So that's one of my dreams too, that I would like to see. Just we'll keep plugging away, I guess. Man, I yeah, uh, I'm just I I love all three of your dreams so much. And like I think it really points to to like I think sometimes people have it in their head that they like, oh, we all need to learn this history. We all need to learn it. But like, they don't think about the people who actually do that work, right? Like all three of you are telling me, you know, hours and hours, like years of your lives doing this work. It's not just work that you do in two seconds and it goes up, you know, like, and I, I really feel that from, from everything that you all are saying and all your journeys in discovering your family histories. Um, you know, it's a, it's a lot of work and I, I really appreciate the work that all three of you are doing. And, you know, I hope that people see that like, this is this, this panel here, like our faces, this is Virginia history. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes people have it in their head that they have some other sense of what Virginia history really looks like, but this is it and you all are doing it. <laughs> and, you know, I hope people remember how much work that really takes and the faces and the names behind that work. Um, and I think especially with the three of you, because you all are in different mediums too, and how that takes form and takes shape. And I think it's really important, all three of your mediums, because they touch all people, right? Like there isn't some kind of gate kept piece of that to the to the pieces that you create. Um, so I have we have like, 10, 20, 15 minutes. And I just wanted to quickly ask you all, as far as your mediums, like, what is that process like? Because, you know, like I said, you're all three of you are storytellers. And, and in my eyes, all three of you are artists. So like, what is that like sharing, sharing that piece of yourself and art with the world? You know, multimedia. So I, I come from a long line of documentarians. We otherwise we wouldn't have this amazing photo photo. I should say multiple photo albums and documents. Um, you know, beautiful pictures. We wouldn't have any of that if I didn't come from an original group of documentarians. And the, and they and they had some privilege to be able to do that. Um, so I definitely like to. Um, I do primarily film document documentary work, and so, um, but I incorporate the oral history, the audio oral history. I like to also read transcripts of of that, um, and also incorporating archival imagery as well as artifacts and that. So just blending all of that together, you know. Um, I didn't answer this on the last question, but my dream. I have probably about three different you know, short and or feature projects that I would love to do with all of this information. So that's how I would, that's how I see myself blending that. I've done that in other work, you know, working with other people, unpacking their stories. So um, I'd like to do that with this, blend this personal as personal narrative and historical narrative in, in a few projects. So, so that's what I, how I work. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so for me, in terms of this personal, I mean, my everyday life, I am a, um, you know, I'm a visual storyteller. I take still, I make still pictures. Um, I do some short video clips, but as it relates to, uh, this project, 
that was kind of the, this is where I sort of started weaving everything in, into this process of, yeah, taking some uh, video, always making still, you know, still images and then collecting all of the archives. And I myself have not uh, produced something um, with all of these separate entities and brought them all together. I was lucky, like I said, NHK, the public TV in Japan, they they assisted me and they they were the producers of documenting my story and taking, or not taking, but me co collaborating with them with imagery and with my documents and with my voice and with you know my journey. So I did it and I trusted them and that's been done. But like Alicia, I have this dream to take the photos that I've been taking all these years and the historical documents that I've found and that were saved by my dad and my grandmother and by the archives and the interviews I've done, I want to bring them all together and create some sort of book. Also, I could see this being, I mean, there's so many twists and, twists and turns to this uh, story. All of us have twists and turns, but I could see, I would, I want to put it in the universe. I'd love for it to be a movie or some sort of something so that more people could see it and learn this history um, and use some of the images that I've, I've made along the way to be incorporated into these projects. Because I did make a decision when I was um, at first um, embarking on this journey while I was at the University of Michigan, I made a decision not to use my professional camera because I thought that I wanted it to be consistent. So I spoke with my other colleagues, other photojournalists that were there with me on the, on the fellowship, and I decided to use my phone. And I decided because the phone would always be with me and it would not be intimidating. And because it was so personal, I didn't want my story to come off as I'm trying to turn this into something like I wanted to keep it personal but professional but consistent so like I did this sort of one day I'll show all of you one day I mean not everybody in the world but the four of you I took like a, 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 a like a visual diary and I've made this like sort of uh, multimedia thing with just these square images and I made I made I made them all square like Instagram but and I and, and it's like it's kind of dreamy and I have this like vision of pulling those into a book um, with words and with the documents and I don't know if you guys have ever seen those books that are like it's like letters and you can take the letters out and you can look at pictures. I love those kinds of books. Yeah. <laughs> I love them. Oh, that sounds great. <laughs> so anyway, kind of mixing all this stuff. So, so anyway, I haven't brought all this stuff together in one place myself personally. I just, my house has all of it every place. So anyway, um, I like to dream and I hope I'm not, I'm dreamy and I like to dream, but I hope my dreams can come true. <laughs> No. Yeah. yeah. Me too. Like, yeah, I, I have dreams of writing a book too. I, I but I I keep reworking it. Like I think I'm not sure what exactly what my parameters will be, but that's my dream too, to kind of all the personal, the kind of the smaller story and how it fits in the bigger stories and just kind of figuring a pathway through all those layers and how that would work best in book length is something that I've been struggling with for a couple of years now. So but it's a work in progress and it underscores something I wanted to say while I was listening to everyone else is that, you know, that we talked about in one of our earlier calls, which is, you know, we're all independent creators, you know, we're not, we don't have like a big financial institution behind us. This is hard work, as Emma said, and, you know, we're independent scholars in terms of like that kind of research, and it's difficult. It's not like we have a pot of money. You know, when, I, when I've published essays, I've been lucky to get some essays published and find some editors willing to publish my writing, but you kind of have to go through that process of convincing somebody else that your story's worthwhile. And, you know, I've had plenty of 
things get rejected. So it's kind of a, it's a hard process. So kind of figuring out what things you keep moving forward through those channels where you have to deal with the gatekeepers and how can then you keep working on this side where you're creating your own work and creating your own meaningful stories regardless of the gatekeepers and whether somebody wants to give you any money or any any showcase or play or anything because those you have to kind of keep operating on both tracks you know of course you want more people to see it and that means getting past gatekeepers oftentimes but that's not always easy so just the struggle on the balancing act yeah thank you kim um well first of all i want to thank you all for sharing with me your dreams and sharing it with the audience and i and i hope we're all manifesting these into into real life and i feel really good about that um so i appreciate you all sharing that um, I do want to get to some of the audience questions because we got a lot of comments um, and questions throughout. Um, and I do want to say one of the comments was, "Your stories are awesome." I thought about doing my. I thought doing my family history was hard. I can't imagine. I want to know more about your journeys. Um, so one of the questions was, "Do you all have kind of channels that folks can follow um, that you'd like to share uh, that folks can maybe follow any stories or?" how they can kind of keep along and see what, what is happening in the future. Could you post our websites or Twitter handles or anything like that in the chat maybe? If Yeah, if you all uh, just let me know what you guys would want, like to share and I can send an email out to our participants um, and okay. put some things in the chat, yeah. That'd be great. I think that would be probably the best um, if you send it out later. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm reading through some of the questions. Uh, one was, we all encounter discoveries of previously unknown information about our ancestors. Um, you guys kind of touched on this answer actually, um, but I'm still gonna to ask it. There are moments when we realize that our ancestors withheld information to protect us from whatever they believed would damage us. So how do you go forward as you discover the things they didn't want you to know? That's a heavy one, so could be potentially emotionally expensive. So please feel free to answer it if you are comfortable doing so. Yeah, I'll just say it. It'll probably just sound like a reiteration of what I said before. Um, you know, with my grandfather, you know, we, our immediate family knew knew the stories and and um but he only went so far and hearing some of some of the details being filled in later by other family members and some of the research um i i knew he was always holding back because of that statement i said earlier that it felt it was safer it was safer and it was safer to identify as black, and I don't know who who all he was talking about. He just said that. I, well, I do know, and I won't go there now. But I I do know. I, I do know who he's talking about. Um, so it, again, it just makes me feel this sense of anger and loss that there's a whole aspect of culture and connection that I don't know and um, may never know. Um, I, I I feel really I feel really resentful <laughs> to the system, not no, not necessarily to my my family members, because as we talked about earlier, a lot of things were withheld for survival and just being able to um, just live. So um, so yeah, so I'll just leave it there. I, I don't I, I feel like families kept hold, held on to things for our protection or their own protection or their own mental capacity to, to deal with some of that. So, so that's what I'll say there. Yeah, I would agree too. And I think I'm just reiterating also, but you know, um, my mother's decision not to teach Vietnamese to her two children, a decision that she clearly made because she felt like it would make her life safer and maybe protect her more to be as American as possible, you know, that she had left her country. And I was so upset for so long that she kept this language for me. 
And I have tried really, really hard to learn Vietnamese as a language as an adult. And I, I don't have great aptitude for it. I'll keep trying. I'll keep working my Duolingo and I'm taking Vietnamese lessons. It's hard. It is a hard language. And I, I feel this barrier. Like, I feel like that's one key way that when you can speak your mother's language, like that, that I feel, I feel sad, you know, I feel sad that she could have just been speaking her own language, her mother tongue to me freely, freely in the house, just being herself and talking in the language she wanted to speak in. And it makes me sad and upset that she felt like she did, she couldn't do that. You know, it still speaks English to me now. And then when I have tried to speak my few little sentences of Vietnamese to her, she's kind of pats me on the head, like, nice try. <laughs> like, but that's a little, you know, it's the point of sadness for me, you know. So, but I understand. And that, that gro growing towards understanding has been very important, you know, for me. Um, so the, the part of the question, tell me the last part of the question. It, um, how do you go forward as you discover the things they didn't want you to know? Oh, that's it. Yeah, didn't want us to know. So I think in my case, um, on this part of my story, because there's so many other parts of unknown things and, you know, but on this particular slither, um, I think because my dad was so young, he was three when, um, you know, December 7th, 1941 happened. His brother was two. His mother, my grandmother, was left uh, as a young 20 something year old uh, black woman in Suffolk during the segregated South. Her, the love of her life, I think, was, you know, now gone. Money was gone. And I think she suffered emotionally um and now as an adult and now that i understand a lot of the story i'm sure she had a mental breakdown and so my father actually was not raised with her and i think all of this is because of racism because of the war because of white supremacy and so she did the best she could to cope and so my dad was so young and so he just grew up in that world of, of what his mother provided right and the other relatives and so he grew up just whatever was told to him from a little child that's all he knew and so but as he grew grew up and became educated and intellectually understood what happened but really didn't know the details but also intellectually understood he himself could not go, tap into that pain. He had enough of it from, you know, living in Jim Crow South in, in Virginia, dealing with the black white stuff, that putting this extra layer of, of trauma, he knew he just couldn't do it. He could only do so much trauma, right? So, but because at the end of his life, he obviously, like I said before, was reflecting on this and didn't want to slip away. I think that he gave me the green light to speak about whatever I find. And that's what I'm doing. But like I said, I also have my own power to say no and to, to um, interpret what I learn and decide what I share and think about my ancestors' privacy. Mm -hmm. I often do that, but I think that I've been very truthful about what I found because I think it contributes to where we are in contemporary America today. And if we don't understand the pain and trauma of yesterday, then folks, we're not gonna understand, it's gonna take even more time to get, to get to get over this hump or to continue forward. So I feel it's a um, it's a responsibility, a duty of mine to share as much as I can um, with the right people. And so. Yeah, and could yeah. I add just um, the, you know, the, a p the piece about how do you move forward? I think w with information that was withheld, I think for me, and I would guess with uh, Regina and Kim, 
learning those things fuels us to keep wanting to find out more. What what else can we find? And and why was this withheld? And and what's the story behind all of that? So I, I think that keeps pushing any of us forward. Well, I shouldn't speak yeah. for you. <laughs> no, I, I, I want to know more. So it's not a it's not a discourage it's not to discourage us. I think it gives us more courage and more curiosity and more wanting to know yeah the fire is definitely there yeah. yeah wow well just like that we are already at 7 30. um so i i am just 7 27 7 27 so it gives me time to echo some of the comments in here is just i want to uh repeat some of the things people said is we are the primary sources for tomorrow's historians and we need to tell our stories to school children so they know the truth and i i think that comes all back to like you all are storytellers and truth tellers and i'm really really humbled to be in this space with you to hear your stories to have conversations with all three of you um who are telling and i'm, I'm repeating myself a little but who are to sharing with the world that this is real real stories and real people and when we talk about history i think that's another piece of it sometimes it's too easy to forget that these are very real people and that every single person has a whole world a whole family like that ripple effect regina that you're talking about so i think i am just really appreciative for all three of you because i think that's made really clear like when you all t tell your stories um and when you all share this with us so i'm i'm very humbled um and I just want to thank you all. I want to thank any audience members that are hanging on still, any audience members watching this later um, at home. And I hope that you all are feeling inspired and, and realize that the agency that you can give your ancestors, because I think that's something that's that's really inspiring to me. Um, so thank you all so much. Thank you for joining me tonight. Uh, and I'm excited to see how your dreams are manifested. I hope you all have a great evening, um, and I'm going to go ahead and end the webinar, but if you want to go revisit this again, we will have this on our, our Library of Virginia YouTube page, um, and my email is on the event, uh, event page, so if you have further questions, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you all again, and have a, have a wonderful night.